Hey there, imagine you're trying to send an important message to a friend, but your nosy mailman is trying to listen in to whatever you guys are talking about. As you ponder ways to secure your messages, you realize that you need cryptography. Cryptography is the art of writing coded messages using functions and algorithms that can also be reversed to decrypt messages. So you have decided to encrypt the message, but how? You see an empty roll of toilet paper on the floor. This gives you an idea. So, you get a strip of paper and wrap it around the roll. Then, you write your message horizontally creating a scramble of letters. This message can only be deciphered with a roll of the same diameter. This is perfect because you know that your friend also has the same toilet paper. But, before you send it, you realize that your mailman, being the master decipher that he is, might also have the same roll and he might be able to decipher the message easily. You need a better cipher. You think, what if you shifted all the alphabet over by a key number? and assign a unique alphabet to each new one. This is the Caesar cipher. You shift all your letters by three, so that A is now D, and so on. When you get to X, it wraps back to A, and Y is B, and Z is C. Let's write your message. So for T corresponds with W, H corresponds with K, I is L, and S is V. And then continuing that, you can write the rest of your message. You can also create the Caesar cipher in Python by using the index of each letter in your plain text and adding the shift key to it. You can use mod 26 to make sure that if your key is bigger than 26, it will just loop back around to A, B, C, etc. It will also make sure that if you enter an X and your key is something greater than 3, it will loop back around to the A. Here if we test it out, hello world, enter 7, and there's our scrambled cipher text. You finish writing your message and put it in the mail. You will send the key in the next mail so that the mailman cannot decipher your code. But before that, you realize that there are only 25 possible ways to scramble your message. So your mailman would easily be able to break your code within minutes. You need something more robust, so you decide to scramble all the letters, creating a substitution cipher. You scramble the alphabet and write it under your alphabet. Similarly to the Caesar cipher, the T corresponds to a Z here, H is F, and so on and so forth. You can code the substitution cipher by entering your own code bet. And in your plain text, when you can extract the index of a regular alphabet, but use that index to code for the code bit alphabet instead. If we test it out, hello world. And let's just spam the QWERTY keyboard. And there is your encrypted message. You feel good about the cipher, but this is still a monoalphabetic cipher, meaning that each coded letter only has one unique letter assigned to it. So, your mailman can easily use a frequency analysis on your message and figure out what the correct letter for each is. A frequency analysis uses the frequency of popular letters in common speech in English to analyze other code bits. For example, right here, this is the frequency of each letter in the scramble we created right now. We can just use the frequency as it is, but that does not make much sense. So if we start with E, since we know that E usually occurs the most, we can see that here there are one letter words which can usually either be A or I. And since A occurs more than I, we'll assign the higher frequency to A and the lower to I. Since there are four J's and two W's, J will be A and W will be I. Similarly, we know that if this starts with an I, there are some common words like is, it, it. We can once again order them by frequency and assign the respective letters to each column. Then we can see words like this can probably be this, or this can spell here. And we can use these frequent letters and analyze them using our frequency alphabet to assign them accordingly. And doing so can eventually reveal the whole message. That's an easy fix. You just need a polyalphabetic cipher so that each letter has multiple letters assigned to it. So you decide to use a homophonic cipher. Here we look at the frequent letters as we looked at before and assign them multiple characters. Since we know that G occurs the most in our cipher, we can assign three more letters to it to decrease its frequency to a fourth of its original. And as we go down, we can do the same with W, Y, Z, J, and so on. Now you have updated your code bet to a code table with certain letters having multiple symbols. You were confident in your method, but it became redundant to know when to use which symbol in a random manner. It is impossible to be truly random in deciding if E should be G, or Alpha, or Beta, or Gamma, and same with the other letters. However, we can create this in Python using pseudorandomness. For the homophonic cipher, you can enter your own code bet, but instead of entering it as a string or an array, you can use a 2D array instead. You don't have to make sure that all the rows and columns are the same length, but just make sure that you put all the letters that represent a particular letter together. Here, instead of using the index of 
the string, you're using the index of the row. And then you can use pseudo-randomization to pick a random letter out of that row itself. For the rows that only have one letter, it will just output that particular letter. But for the ones that have four, it'll just pick one of the four. And here is the Hello World example. It actually looks great. And as you can see right here, if you redid this, it will generate a different cipher for you, which is also great. So this way people won't be able to tell if you have a word repeating or not. But however, you wanted something more predictable and easier to code, of course. You thought, what if instead you used a Caesar cipher, but each letter in the message had a unique shift? By using a different shift for each letter, you created a one-time pad. So you began coding your message, but instead of having one key, you now have a string of shift keys that you wrote down on another strip of paper. To create a one-time pad, you can first start by making a list of shift keys that range between 0 and 26, depending on the length of your plain text. You can make an else to make sure that whenever there are spaces, it enters a 0 so that you don't get your keys mixed up. Then you can use a Caesar cipher and just add the shift. You can use for i in range to iterate through the plain text and the shift list. And you can just add each and every shift to each and every letter. And since you used zeros, you don't have to worry about skipping any letters for the spaces or any other symbols. And here is your encrypted message and a lot of numbers. As you began scribing your message, you soon noticed the redundancy in this method as well. Ultimately, the key was as long as the message itself and it took too long to decipher, you realize your friend would not be happy deciphering your code. You wish that there was a way to automate the one-time pad using electric signals and a unique configuration on your rotor. Here, the key would be the rotor configuration itself that can be sent over to your friend who would have an identical machine with yours. You liked the one-time pad, but wanted to make the key a bit shorter and easier to communicate. So what if you use a keyword whose alphabet index would be the shift key itself? So instead of having a string of numbers, you can just have a set of numbers that keep repeating themselves. This is the Visioneer cipher. Here is a Visioneer grid. What it does is basically lays out the alphabets and shifts them by the key of the index of each of the alphabets. Let's say our code word is my bird's name, Rigel. We have to align the letters to the word that we want to code, right under T-H-I-S-R-I-G-E. Then we find the corresponding columns and the intersecting letter is what we replace it by. And we can do the same for the rest of the message. The grid can be a lot to navigate through sometimes, so there's an easier way to do this as well. We use the alphabet's indices. So if we write all the indices of our original word, 19 and so on, and our keyword, 17 and so on, then we sum up both the values and then we write the letter that occurs at that index. If it's bigger than 26, we can simply subtract 26 as many times to get a number that's on our grid. And as you can see, it creates the same exact cipher as using the grid. Keeping that in mind, you can code the Visioneer cipher by taking the indices of your plain text and your code word, iterating it using a mod function and adding them up, and using that index to find the corresponding letter. Hello world! And as you can see right here, it just looks like the Caesar or substitution cipher. Which is another great thing, because if a person just found your cipher, they won't really be able to tell. And it's frequency test proof. This way, you could also include the grid in your message without anyone being able to figure out your keyword. You were finally feeling confident about your cipher, so you finished your message and gave it to your mailman. Proudly, you walk back to your room and you look outside your window. The mailman is still there but he's doing something now. He is using the Kaczynski examination. Here, you take the ciphertext, you look for reoccurring patterns of three to four characters, and you find the space between each, like we've written out right here. KPOW occurs at a distance of 55, then 110, and so on and so forth. As you can see, the 8 and 142 seem like outlier values, and that's okay because sometimes patterns just occur because of coincidences. And if we just ignore those two numbers, we can see that the greatest common factor between the rest is 5. So we can assume that our keyword is 5 letters long. Then we go back to our ciphertext and count off each of the numbers. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Here, let's color code all the different numbers and extract them from the message. Now we can perform five individual frequency analyses on each. Here's a common frequency chart. We can align it with all of our frequency charts. And if we follow the E to the letter that it lines with, we should be able to figure out which letter it corresponds to. Like here, first one is R, then I, then G, then E, and finally, let's do 16, L. 
And that's actually exactly the word we went for. Afraid that he might be close to deciphering your message, you rush down and snatch your mail from him as soon as possible. What to do now, you think, running laps around your room? You decided to go a completely different route and try some new ways instead of replacing letters. What if you involved numbers in a way? Your first option was that you can make a Polybius square. Here, you make a 5x5 five five square and write the alphabet out like this. You decide to put I and J together because why not? Now, instead of writing your message through letters, you can write them as two-digit numbers. Commonly, you write the row first and then the column, so 4, 4, 2, 3, 2, 4, 4, 3, and so on. Now, to code the Polybius square, you have to input your square using a 2D array, once again. This is good because you get to choose which letter you want to exclude or not. You can also include two variables, excluded letter, in its place so that if it occurs in your message, it'll know what to enter it with. Here you can just search for which row contains the letter you're looking for and when it finds the row it will see which index the letter occurs at and then it'll add both of them in one number and send it across. We included the elif to make sure that the excluded letter is accounted for and else, like always, to make sure we can use spaces and punctuation. And let's test it out, hello world, and I love this one, just a bunch of numbers that have no meaning to the untrained eye. You can also shape your Polybius square however you want. You can exclude Z instead of I and J, or you can just scramble the letters and send it as another grid of itself. Another thing you could have made was a columnar transposition. Here, let's say you use the same five letter key. You can make a column and write out your message under it, wrapping your message around until you run out of letters. Then fill the empty spaces with X's. Now, scramble your key alphabetically along with the columns. Now you write down the letters, top to bottom, left to right. And here is how we can code the columnar transposition in Python. Unfortunately, this method does not include the spaces or punctuations, so first we extract all our alphabets from our plain text. Then we create our 2D array using the length of the keyword. In the for loop, we can sort the letters out into the rows of our list, depending on their index value. Then we can make sure that if any rows have less numbers, they get filled with x's. And here we find the index of each letter in the keyword for the letter as it occurs in the sorted keyword. This will tell us how to scramble our rows in our final result. If we use the same word amber, it will give us 0, 2, 3, 1, 4. And then the for loop will follow the pattern of the numbers to add the rows accordingly. And here is our final message. Once again, a jumble of letters that make no sense, unless you know what's happening. Besides, you realize that you're not actually in the olden times when you can just code things and make it much easier for yourself. Especially like DES, ECC, RSA, AES, and so many more. So you send it via email. Now your soupy mailman has no idea what you are talking about as he sits there and waits at your door. Unless, of course, he figures out how to break a hash.